Thank you, Mutaz, for inviting me along to speak today. <clears throat> what I plan to cover today is the aspects of headaches which I feel are most relevant to general practice. Uh, what I aim to talk about, obviously, is headache red flags, because it's important when you are um, assessing someone with a headache that you don't miss any serious underlying cause. Thereafter, I plan to talk about the commonest types of headaches. And finally, I plan to talk about the treatment of migraines. The key aspect of headache assessment is history taking. Um, examination is of limited benefit. Investigations normally are used to exclude serious causes of the headache. So the vast majority of assessment is all about history taking. And essentially what you're trying to do is identify nuggets of diagnostic value from the history to allow you to sort of subclassify the headache, establish whether it's a migraine, tension type headache or whatever. It's important to remember that there isn't, for example, a blood test for migraine. So the diagnosis is, is purely clinical. In general practice, we obviously are limited to the amount of time we have to assess headaches. Fortunately, in, in, the, in, the, headache, in the headache clinic, I get 30 minutes for new patient assessments. When I explained that to one of my GP colleagues, he said, well, you see the patient, you take a history, examine him, work out a treatment plan, what do you do with the other 25 minutes? And that sort of highlights the fact that in primary care, in the 10 minute consultation, you've commonly got to deal with the headache and the other five presenting symptoms the patient, a patient attends with. So what I suggest to patients, so to, to doctors or GPs in particular, when you're assessing headache, think about splitting it into two consultations. Obviously during the first consultation, you don't want to miss any serious underlying cause for the headache. So you concentrate on red flags in the first consultation and thereafter you can arrange to see the, head, the patient again and go into more detail to try and establish an underlying diagnosis. So during the first consultation, the consultation it's important to, to establish if the headache has any red flags. Red flags are features of the headache which, which lead you to consider there may be a serious underlying cause for the headache. If patients over 50 present with a new onset headache, it's important to check their ESR and CRP to make sure they don't have temporal arthritis. I think it's also important during the first consultation to specifically ask the patient how quickly the headache reached maximum severity. What you're looking for there is whether the person has a thunderclap headache, which is in about 10% of thunderclap headaches are subarachnoid hemorrhages or brain hemorrhages, and obviously that's something you don't want to miss. Most GPs are sophisticated and experienced diagnosticians, and it's important to trust your instincts and not just assess the headache in isolation. So when you see the patient with a sore head, you've also got to use your clinical judgment to put it in the context of any other symptoms they may have. I think it's also worth in the first consultation to consider stopping painkillers if they're overusing them in case there's a medication overuse component to their headaches, something we'll discuss in more depth later on. And you may wish to think about doing a targeted examination and then you can arrange follow-up. The two things most doctors and patients worry about when they've got a headache is a brain hemorrhage and a brain tumour. Brain hemorrhages are relatively easy from a sort of primary care perspective to identify. What you're looking for is someone with that sudden onset severe headache, the whole hit in the back of the head with a baseball bat, headache that reaches maximal severity instantaneously or within a minute or possibly even within five minutes and lasts for more than an hour. And these headaches, from a GP perspective, are sent straight to A&E. In a &E, they'll have an immediate CT scan. If the CT scan's normal, then the clinicians don't yet have absolute confidence that that excludes the fact there can be a brain hemorrhage, and thereafter they'll have a lumbar puncture. The other, the other uh, condition patients and doctors worry about are brain tumours. Brain tumours are very difficult to diagnose because the headache features of a person who's got a brain tumour are very similar to the headache features of a person who doesn't have a brain tumour. So it can be very difficult to tell the difference. I gave a talk on uh, investigations of headache a couple of years ago and I sort of looked into the evidence base for investigating, for, for the presenting symptoms of a brain tumour headache. The best evidence I came across was there's been about five cohorts in the last 20 years of patients who were interviewed 
immediately before they were about to undergo surgery for their brain tumours. Now, there's obviously potential recall bias in this data, so by the time someone is sitting to get their operation, they've probably, probably been seen by multiple doctors, been asked the same question several times, and the way that they tell the questions before their operation or answer the question before their operation may be different from the actual way the headache or the, the symptoms evolved. But the key take-home points are that patients with brain tumours commonly have headaches, and that's commonly the first symptom. However, by the time these patients present to doctors, it's very, very common that not only do they have headaches, but they have accompanying neurology. And certainly within weeks or months, it's very rare for a person to have a brain with a brain tumour to have just a headache. They've virtually always got associated neurology as well. Okay? So the, if you turn that on, if you, if you look at it from a different perspective, it reinforces the importance of, of carefully assessing patients with new onset headaches just in case you're seeing them before the tumour grows and before it starts pressing on bits of the brain makes, to make those bits of the brain not work properly, causing clinical neurological symptoms. So new headaches you need to be very careful assessing just in case you're seeing them before neurology develops. And it's just a headache in isolation. It's also important to remember that a lot of people with brain tumours, it's actually metastases from other parts of the body. So getting back to the whole idea of not just assessing the headache in isolation. And it's also interesting that the sort of classic brain tumour headache symptoms, nausea, vomiting, severe headache, headache and morning awakening, are actually surprisingly uncommon in these studies. So this quote from one of the authors of one of the sort of best most reputable studies I've mentioned sort of summarises what I've just mentioned and he quotes, isolated headache for longer than 10 weeks will only exceptionally be due to an intracranial neoplasm. So if we go through the red flags, the headache red flags, the things not to miss when you initially present a when you initially assess a patient with headache. Obviously thunderclap headache, obviously headache with accompanying focal or generalised neurological symptoms or signs, not suggestive of an aura. Now, as I'll explain later, part of a migraine is that there can be transient focal neurology with it. But you don't, patients whose headaches are diagnosed with migraines essentially don't need scans. So it's important to be aware that patients with an aura, you wouldn't need to investigate. When a person over 50 presents with a new onset headache, that's a red flag for a few reasons. Firstly, patients who are older are more likely to have underlying pathology. Secondly, when we're thinking of headaches, the majority will be primary headaches like migraines, and the natural history of a migraine is that that will initially present in, young, in a younger population. So if a person presents with their first migraine in their 50s, you've got to seriously ask yourself, is this a migraine or is this something else mimicking a, mimicking a migraine? The other important aspect of a new onset in a patient over 50, as we mentioned, is the potential that it could be temporal arthritis, and again, you can check inflammatory markers. If someone's inflammatory markers are normal, it reassures you that it's very, very unlikely the patient's got temporal arthritis. If the inflammatory markers are elevated, then it, it could be due to something else like inflammatory bowel disease. Unexplained change in headache is obviously another red flag. The scenario I use where it sort of draws in the cusp between, well, if you see a patient in their mid to late 40s with, who's had lifelong migraines and there's been a, a dramatic increase in the frequency of the migraines, you could, on the one hand, if the patient's female, you could explain that as being expected secondary to the perimenopausal phase, or you could say, well, she's 48, there's an unexplained change in the headaches. So I think that scenario to me sort of encapsul encapsulates a sort of cut-off point where some doctors would say they need a scan, other doctors would say that's an explained change in the headache, so therefore there's no need for a scan. But certainly a significant unexplained change in a headache is a red flag. And obviously new onset headaches in patients who've got history of cancer or HIV. As we'll speak about later on, patients with migraines find that they're headaches get worse with any type of stimulation, including head movements or activity. So if a headache is made worse by activity, then that's something you'd expect from a migraine. If, however, a patient finds that their headache is precipitated 
or started by cough, sneeze, bend, postural change, then those are features of a headache with raised intracranial pressure. So it's very important to draw that distinction because if you don't draw that distinction, then you could potentially be classifying 15% of the female population who've got migraines as having a headache with raised features of raised intracranial pressure. So headache worsened by activity equals migraine. Headache precipitated by, precipitated by movement or postural change, you've got to consider raised intracranial pressure. And the question I always ask patients is, if you have no headache, if you have no headache, if you cough or sneeze, does it start a headache? And that's the sort of question I tend to use to discriminate that important point. Other issues, obviously, if someone's got headaches with features of meningitis, then that, that's obviously a red flag as well. So, if we're, so we're still on that first consultation. You want to be clear in your mind that before you send the patient home to make an appointment to come back again, you're not missing any serious causes for the headache, you're not missing any red flags, and by asking these questions in the history, you would be confident that you've not missed any red flags. Is the patient over 50? Did the headache reach maximum severity instantaneously? Is it a new onset headache? Has there been an unexplained change? Has the headache precipitated by Vosalva manoeuvre? Is it a non migraine headache present on awakening? Is there neurology which isn't an aura? And do they have underlying risk factors from the past medical history? And does it sound like meningitis? About 12 years ago, before I worked in a headache clinic, when I was a GP locum, I was always terrified of seeing patients with headaches. I was always worried I was going to miss a brain tumour or a brain haemorrhage. I remember there was an article in the BMG, an editorial by what I now realise was a sort of world-renowned headache expert, and the, the editorial was to scan or not to scan. And I was hoping that he would simply write down a list of yes, scan, no, don't scan. Unfortunately, after reading the editorial, I was actually more confused than when I, start, when I started reading it. So in terms of, in my mind, the best I can do to try and synthesise down guidelines and when to scan or not to scan is, if someone has a migraine, particularly if it's episodic, particularly if it's characteristic, you don't need to do a scan. If someone's got a red flag, you do need to do a scan. The more the headache, so the less migraine features a headache has, and the more featureless it is, the more diagnostic uncertainty, the more likely you are to do a scan in the patient. And I certainly think it's appropriate to scan for reassurance, because if someone wants a scan, They've got a headache, they want a scan, they're not reassured that they don't have a brain tumour by your consultation skills, then if you don't do the scan, they're going to keep passing on doctors until someone does. So you could argue that it's a, it's, a, you know, it's a good use of resources to do the scan at the outset. What you need to think about, because the, the evidence base for the decision as to, whether, as to whether to do a brain scan or not is very limited and poor, you've got to put it in the context of the consultation and you've got to have an awareness that there's lots of other pressures that can influence whether you do a brain scan or not. Again, trust your instincts, have an awareness of the patient's expectations and anxieties. In terms of clinical setting, availability of scans is certainly an issue, and I certainly do more scans in the headache clinic than I do in primary care. I mean, certainly MRIs, I tend to do a lot of MRIs simply because Dr. Tiagi, who runs the clinic, does MRIs, and he says, why would you do a CT when you can do an MRI? Whereas we had a, we had a, a geriatric trainee from, from Ayrshire, who was in the clinic a few times, and she said they just wouldn't do an MRI for us. So there's, there's the clinical context, and the clinical setting, and availability of resources is also a factor. And there's also the, the, the medical legal aspects as well. You want to cover yourself, you don't want to miss anything. But the bit I want to talk about is incidental findings. So when you do a brain scan, all you're doing is taking pictures of someone's brain, and approximately one in 10 of those brain scans will be reported as being abnormal. This is actually data which was published from us as GPs and primary care physicians referring patients via the direct access service to this hospital. And out of the 4,000 patients or so that were referred, 10% of those scans were reported as being abnormal. One and a half were reported as being due to the headache. So what I explain to patients is that there's lots of normal variations. And the analogy I use is that if I stopped 100 people in the street, took their tops off and looked at their backs, some would have boils, scars, hairs and freckles on it. 
And that natural variation also applies to people's brains. I think it's very important to have that conversation with a patient, particularly if you're going to scan for reassurance, because if you do scan for reassurance and you find a pineal cyst or an incidental finding, people worry about cysts in their brain much more than they worry about cysts in their back of the leg. And you could actually be causing much more anxiety by doing a scan for reassurance. So I think it's really important. And also it means that if they do, certainly from the, the headache perspective, if I have a scan that comes through with an incidental finding, it's much easier for me to write a letter to say, as we discussed, you've got this normal variant, another doctor is going to do a different scan to look at the, to get bit, to get different pictures. I think it's much easier to sell that concept to someone who you've pre-prepared by giving a talk about incidental findings. Second consultation, make a diagnosis. The majority of people you see who have lots of headaches, which can be disabling, have got migraines. Okay, migraine is. When you're diagnosing migraines, it's disabling headaches, last from hours to days, they can be sick, they're sensitive to the world around them, and as a consequence of the fact that they're sensitive to the world around them, they remove themselves from the world around them and they go into a, a, a sensory deprived environment to try and go to sleep. Why are migraines important? Migraines are common, they're also disabling, but the key problems with my, the key issues with migraines are that they affect young, healthy people, and they're unpredictable. So I, I, my wife gets migraines, and I remember about a few years ago, one morning I woke up, going to work, and she couldn't lift her head off the pillow. Interestingly, the World Health Organization classify a patient suffering from migraine as being as disabled as someone with quadriplegia, psychosis, or dementia. So, you know, you're waking up nine, half eight in the morning, want to go to work, you've got a two-year-old two child, it's, it just highlights the fact that there's, social, there's a social economic impact to migraines because migraine sufferers are young, they've got jobs, they look after children, and it's unpredictable. So if you knew a week on Tuesday you were going to have a migraine attack, you could, you could arrange childcare, cancel work, take, take a duvet day, take a holiday, whatever. So those are the reasons why, why there's a significant social, social economic burden for migraines. In terms of diagnosing migraines, you can really split it into four different bits. First bit is the pre-monetary bit, which is, which is the symptoms that come before the headache. There's the headache itself. There's the concept of the world around you annoys you. And when I mention that to migraine sufferers, they very commonly have a sort of acknowledging smile because they sort of realise that I sort of get it and understand what they've been banging on about for a while sometimes. And there's also the aura, which is transient self-limiting neurological symptoms or signs. So if we look at each four of these parts of the migraine in isolation, pre-monetary phase can last a couple of days, comes before the headache. There's three specific aspects of it that I've underlined. Sometimes people can get excessive yawning during a pre-monetary phase. That is a dopaminergic phenomenon which suggests that there may be a dopamine component to the pathophysiology of migraine and also reinforces the, the value of using an anti-dopaminergic antiemetic like domperidone. There's all, obviously the MHRA stuff about domperidone, but if you're using it relatively infrequently, then you could argue it's, it's a good choice for migraines. The second one is food cravings. There's a sort of misconception that chocolate and cheese trigger migraines. What in actual fact we think happens is that people get a pre the migraine starts, they have pre-monetary symptoms, including food cravings, eat lots of chocolate, eat lots of cheese, get a sore head the next day, and assume it's to do with eating the chocolate and cheese. And the third one is a stiff neck. It, a lot of people get a stiff neck, get a migraine the next day, and assume it must be coming from their neck. But in actual fact, it's quite common for the stiff neck to be the sort of warning or the pre-monetary symptoms of the migraine attack. One of the important aspect, one of the important reasons that you would like to diagnose the premonitory phase is, as we'll discuss, the sooner you treat a migraine attack, the more effective the treatment is. And if you can actually pick up warning symptoms, it gives you the opportunity to use the treatment even before the migraine fully evolves. Migraine headache. So when we talk about a migraine headache, we talk in this sort of lucid sense. So if someone has head pain, neck pain, facial pain, 
with migraine features, then you would call it a migraine. I get a lot of referrals from ENT, patients present with facial pain, GP thinks it's sinusitis, ENT do their thing, stick cameras up people's noses and stuff, work out their sinuses are fine, refer to me, and the person describes how when they do have their facial pain, they feel sick, the world around them annoys them, they go to bed, and it's migraines that just so happen to be in their face as opposed to in their head. So the location of a migraine isn't important. If it's only on the one side, then you would consider something called a cluster headache, which we'll talk about briefly later on. But the location isn't important. What is important is that you would expect migraines at some point to be disabling, so the severity is important, and also the associated features. What I, was, what I do want to mention is the headache at the bottom, ice pick pain. What can sometimes confuse, particularly the GPs, is people who have migraines, but also this other type of headache called an idiopathic stabbing headache or ice pick pain. I think ice pick pain is a very good description because it feels as if someone sticks an ice pick in your head. Short lasting, sharp pains, last a few seconds, obviously completely different from migraines, and if you've got the two of them, perfectly reasonably, it would confuse an non-specialist to think, well, why can this be a migraine if it only lasts a few seconds? So ice pick pains commonly coexist with migraines. And it's important when you do see someone with an ice pick pain, you make sure that the ice pick pain is not precipitated by coughing, sneezing, bending, or postural change, because if it is, that could be a raised intracranial pressure headache. So assuming it's not precipitated by those things, you would classify it as an ice pick pain, and that which can coexist coexist with migraine, but they're separate entities. You'll be glad to know that I'm not going to try and explain <laughs> this slide to you. What it does is it reminds me that one of the aspects of a migraine is that as all the information goes in through your senses, through touch, through your eyes, through your nose, through your ears, it all centralises in a bit of the brainstem called the trigeminal vascular nucleus. And as that information goes up the way through the midbrain into the cerebral cortex where you've got consciousness and awareness, it's as if there's a volume button in the midbrain which turns everything up. So when you've got a migraine attack, lights don't get lighter, you just think they do. You know, uh, noises don't get louder. So there's a perception thing that you've got a sensitive brain which in the, in everything's turned up. And that's the whole concept of the world around you annoys you. I suppose another thing to, to mention, when you're Diagnosing migraines, it's, it's, it commonly can be much more valuable to ask people what they do as opposed to how they feel. So people may say that lights don't annoy them, but they'll choose to go into a dark room, lie still, try and sleep. And patients with severe migraines, because any type of sensory stimulation makes a headache worse, they'll remove themselves from a stimulating environment, a dark, quiet room, lie still, try and sleep. Migraine disorder describes transient focal neurological symptoms lasting from five, five to 60 minutes, which can occur before or during the headache. Occasionally, you can get the aura without a headache. Um, mainly visual, can be sensory, but can also be speech aphasic and, and, and speech problems. This slide here encapsulates the progression of a visual aura over time. It starts off in the top left-hand corner with a small scotoma, a small hole in the vision with visual distortion around the sides and over time it evolves and the hole gets bigger. I don't know if you've ever heard of the, 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 the phrase fortification spectra. That describes the zigzag line and if you looked at a medieval castle from above then that's the shape of the wall so that's the fortification spectra. So the, the, it's, got a, it's got a mixture of positive neurological signs, the visual distortion, negative neurological signs, which is the loss of vision, and the, the neurological symptoms and signs are evolving and progressive. And that's a classic pattern of focal neurology that constitutes an aura, which is the exact opposite of a TIA, which is what everyone worries about. When you have a TIA, then it's like the, it's like the, the tap being turned off, so there's no blood supply, so normally the symptoms will reach maximum instantaneously and there'll be negative symptoms. You'll have no vision, you'll have no sensation. Whereas if you have a migraine, you've got tingling and numbness, which progressive and evolves. So the classic scenario in a migraine is the sensory symptoms will be a mixture of tingling and numbness, 
normally running from the fingertips up the arm into the face on the same side as the headache. So that's one of the ways you can obviously distinguish between a migraineous aura and a TIA. The other ways to distinguish between the two of them is the fact that young, fit, healthy people like yourselves get migraines. Old people with cardiovascular risk factors tend to have TIAs. So the demographic of the person sitting of, of, of the population can help as well. Obviously, if in doubt, as a, a basic principle of medicine is, if in doubt, think worst scenario and do what's needed to be done to make sure you're not missing a TIA. <coughs> this slide sort of summarises the whole migraine attack. Initially, you have the premonitory symptoms. Then you have the aura. And then you have progression of the headache. And you find that as the severity of the headache increases, there's a corresponding increase to the world around you annoying you. Then afterwards, the next day, you can have a sort of hangover feeling. And the day after a migraine, people feel the same way as they would feel if they had a really bad hangover after drinking the night before. So, tension type headache, it's a very unsatisfactory, it's a very unsatisfactory concept. Tension type headache, in a sense, is a diagnosis of exclusion. And I think a better name for it is a featureless headache. Because patients with a tension type or featureless headache basically say no to all the questions you ask them. And the headache has no features. So it's never disabling. There's no associated features. There's no triggers. And for me, the, the best question to diagnose tension headaches is asking people whether going to the gym, doing vigorous activity, being busy at work, if that makes a headache go away because it distracts you, then it just can't be a migraine, and that would be a tension headache. People whose most severe headaches are made better by activity, it just can't be a migraine. It's inconceivable that someone who's got a disabling migraine where the world around them annoys them, it's inconceivable that they would want to go to the gym. So people who do go to the gym with their worst headache, you would certainly think of it as being a tension headache. So, and this slide just reinforces what I've just said, that people say no to all the questions you ask when they've got a tension headache. Cluster headaches. Cluster headaches are very rare, but it's very, very important that you have an awareness, have an awareness of them. There's a chap in London who has probably seen more cluster headaches than anyone in the world, and he's seen at least 200 mothers who've got cluster headaches, and every single one of them says a cluster headache is more painful than having a baby. The good thing about having a baby is it can as finished and you've got a baby. If you have cluster headaches, you can have it up to five times a day. Okay? And when you see people with new onset migraines, always have in the back of your mind, could this be a cluster headache? So if the headache is strictly unilateral, if there's autonomic symptoms, red, watery eye, flushing of the cheek, um, drooping, drooping of the eyelid, running of the nostril, then no symptoms can on occasion happen in migraines, but they're more suggestive of cluster headaches. If people have got those type of features to the headache, then it would, it would sort of set off a wee alarm bell and you may want to then sort of go on the computer and remind yourself of the features of cluster headache. But the key difference between a migraine and a cluster headache is that when people have got a migraine, they lie still because movement makes it worse. If someone's got a cluster headache, the severity of the pain is so intense that people undertake bizarre things, they, 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 they do bizarre things to distract themselves from the headache. I always remember I seen a chap who was in his late 40s who was a farmer and he sort of fit, he, he, he fitted neatly into my perception of, 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 of farmers being the type of people who go on with things, high pain threshold, etc. And this gentleman, most nights, when he had a cluster headache, he would go out of bed, he'd go in a shower, turn the shower on, he would drop from side to side in the shower and cry for two hours every night. So that highlights the severity of the pain. Cluster headaches, and if you see someone with a migraine who, who, who's active, who's agitated, who's distressed, who walks about, then seriously think about cluster headaches. And if you think cluster headaches, refer to headache clinics, because these, these headaches are so severe, I think they're entitled to see people like us who've got the best chance of trying to treat them. <clears throat> Chronic daily headache is not a diagnosis. All it does is describe headaches which are common and long last, common and they've been there for a while. So it's headaches that are there more than 15 days a month for more than three months. 
Now, the more than 15 days a month is a logical but arbitrary cut-off. So that means it's a headache that's there more often than not or more than 50% of the time. And what you commonly find is the natural history of migraines is that they may start off having episodes of severe headaches and over time it may evolve into a background headache with exacerbations from time to time. Um, and what can commonly cause that progression or transformation is overusing painkillers, which we'll talk about in a minute. So when you see people with headaches all the time, your best opportunity to extract migraine features from the headache is to ask them about their worst headaches. Because when people have their worst headaches, that's when they're most likely to have migraine features. And if you see someone who's got a spectrum of headaches ranging from 2 out of 10 to 10 out of 10, if the 10 out of 10 headaches have got bed, lights annoy them, noises annoy them, then it's, you would, you would, it's very likely that all the headaches are migraines of varying degrees. And if you then um, <coughs> look at it quite closely, what you tend to find is the 2 out of 10 headaches is just a headache. The 5, 6 out of 10 in severity headaches, lights, noises, smells will annoy them slightly. They'll be able to go to work, but when the phone rings or when the lights go on, it annoys them. And then the 10 out of 10 headaches are disabled and go to bed. So chronic migraines, spectrum of headaches, ranging from maybe 2 to 10 out of 10. When you see people um, with chronic headaches and you suspect it may be migraines, there's other clues that you can elicit from the history. Um, people who suffer from bad hangovers when drink alcohol, where they're absolutely wiped out for two days after the night out, even though they've drank the same as their friends, it's, ve it's very common these, person, these people have actually got a migraine brain and they've got migraines. Other things to think about is travel sickness is quite common for my people with migraine sufferers to suffer from travel sickness. They also commonly may have had a family history, family history of migraines or when they were children they may have had migraines, abdominal migraine, cyclical vomiting syndrome. What you also, one of the questions I ask is, have you at any time in your life ever had to go to bed during the day with a headache? Have you, do you perceive yourself to be a headache person? And these sort of, if people say yes to these sort of questions, then it's very likely they've got migraines. And you do see people who are migraine sufferers who talk about their normal headaches because, they've, because headaches are so normal to them that they've got a perception that that's the, same, that's the same for everyone. And I had a medical student about two months ago who talked about her normal headaches that everyone gets. And after coming to my clinic, she realised it's actually migraine she's got. Cervical gyrate headache, mainly for reference, this is the International Headache Society diagnostic criteria for cervical gyrate headache. <clears throat> but basically, if someone has got neck pain and a headache with migraine features, I would regard the neck pain as being part of the migraine. If someone has got neck pain and a headache that isn't a migraine, then I would seriously consider whether it's a cervical gyrate headache or a headache Re originating in the neck, particularly if they also have signs of neck pathology. It can be radiological signs, but mainly for me it's clinical signs. So if someone has tenderness and palpation, pain in neck movements, then I'd be thinking about a cervical genic headache. It can be common for the two of them to coexist, and they may have migraines causing their neck pain and a bit of cervical genic headache. In that situation, then if I concentrate on successfully treating the migraines, that would tend to be the disabling headaches or disabling symptoms that they experience, and I think I could make a significant net benefit to the symptom burden. If they want to see a physio, then certainly the physio won't do their migraines any harm. It's questionable whether it will do them any good, and there's some evidence to suggest that physio input can help a cervicogenic headache. In terms of treatment for migraines, when I see a person who have diagnosed migraines, I explain to them that they've been unfortunate enough to have been born with a migraine brain, which predisposes them to having migraine attacks. I can't cure them, but I can try and control them by recommending some lifestyle strategies, by trying to, ident try trying to get the patient to identify and avoid triggers, and then to institute treatment. Initially, abortive therapy when the headache comes, and thereafter, prophylaxis to try and prevent the headaches coming in the first place. 
lifestyle modification, migraine brains like regularity. So if you can have a regular pattern to your lifestyle, eat and sleep regularly, try and avoid stress, then all these strategies can, in a population of migraine sufferers, reduce the frequency of migraines. It's obviously from an individual basis, I can't guarantee that would be the case. But eating, sleeping regularly, avoid overuse of caffeine and avoid alcohol, uh, drink plenty of water, regular, regular exercise, avoid stress. So this slide encapsulates the fact that people with migraine brains have got sensitive brains which are receptive to triggers. Maximum abortive therapy for the migraine. It's important that you realise that a migraine attack is like an avalanche. So when you use abortive therapy, it's important to, treat, to use a treatment either at the onset or if possible before the migraine starts. And the maximum treatment is paracetamol, non-steroidal, triptan and antiemetic. During a migraine attack, people commonly have nausea or vomiting. They get stomach paralysis. So commonly, it's logical to use medications that aren't, aren't absorbed during, through their stomach. So you can use nasal sprays, injections, and suppositories. And what's very important is that patients using abortive therapy only use it two or three days a week. And they try very hard to avoid codeine to prevent a medication overuse headache. So, Medication overuse headache, again, it's a bit of an, it's an arbitrary diagnosis. The cutoff, it, it, it describes patients who've got headaches more than 15 days a month. They've been overusing painkillers for more than three months. It's calculated in terms of the number of days they take the medication, not the number of tablets they take. So if someone takes two triptan doses on the one day for a migraine, that would count as one treatment day. And it's... The, the, the definition of overusing the medication in the context of, of medication overuse headache is much less than what they can take for pain. So it's codeine, less, they've got codeine or triptans more than 10 days a month, non steroidals or paracetamol greater than 15 days a month. When people have got a medication overuse headache as well as a migraine, that can act as a barrier and prevent prophylactic and preventive drugs from working sort of in a similar way to people who are alcoholics find antidepressants don't work because alcohol sort of acts as a barrier to stop the antidepressants from working. One of the difficulties when managing medication overuse headache is that when the patient stops the, the, the tablets, then the headache gets worse before it gets better for up to eight weeks. For triptans, maybe one to two weeks, but if they're using lots of codeine, it can take up to six or eight weeks before the headache starts to improve. There's many challenges dealing with patients with a medication obvious headache. Patients firstly regard it as being a bit of a contradiction. So it's common sense that if you've got pain or head pain, you'll obviously take painkillers. So what you've got to do is deconstruct the person's health beliefs, which have been reinforced by the fact that when they've got their sore head, the GP commonly gives them cocodamol. They, they're admitted to hospital with a sore head. They get discharged and the medics give them codeine and tramadol. They go to the chemists and they get headaches for headaches, which is cocodamol. So there's all these pressures that reinforce the fact that the patient feels that, that they can use codeine and lots of painkillers for headaches. And you've got to completely contradict that, deconstruct their health beliefs, re-educate them and also motivate them to stop these tablets, even though their headache's going to get worse for up to six weeks before it gets better. Okay, so it, it is a bit of a challenge within the 30 minutes of the consultation. And again, you reinforce the fact that when they are overusing their codeine, then that will act as a barrier and it will reduce the effectiveness of any other tablets that they, they may be taking for their migraines. <clears throat> I should also add that you, you tend to think of a medication overuse headache only really affecting a migraine brain there was an interesting study done by a headache specialist in Whips Cross Hospital where she went to a rheumatology clinic where people take obviously lots of opiates and what she found is if people have got rheumatoid arthritis plus migraines and they take lots of codeine, they get a medication overuse headache. But people who have rheumatoid arthritis but no migraines don't get a medication overuse headache even if they take lots of codeine. So we think it's something to do with the, 
biology of the migraine brain, which makes them predisposed to having a medication obvious headache. So, some difficulties arise. So, if you have a patient who gets headaches five days a week, and you say to them, you can only take abortive therapy two days a week, then what do they do the other three days? Well, firstly, you've got to say to them, what I don't want to do is make your headaches worse, but giving you something that isn't working. After all, if the eight cocodamol you were taking every day were working, you wouldn't actually be in my clinic. So firstly, you've got to, that's one of the approaches I use. Secondly, you advise them to treat the worst headaches, and also you recommend starting prophylaxis. Second thing is, what if a person has fibromyalgia, chronic body pain and head pain, and they're on bucket loads of cocodamol or tramadol or opiates? What I tend to do in that situation is use non-opiate strategies, non-steroidals, neuropathic drugs, tricyclic antidepressants, after all, can be used for migraines and for chronic pain. Gabapentin and pregabalin tend to be more sort of migraine neutral, but you wouldn't expect them to make the migraines worse. Ultimately, what sometimes happens is you ask the patient to make a choice. It's up to you. What's worse? Do you want head pain or body pain? And, you know, that's sort of how I tend to approach it. Triptans. The key thing about the triptans, which is one of the, obviously, abortive therapies for migraines, is that they cause 10, approximately 10% constriction of blood vessels. So they're contraindicated in people who've got damaged blood vessels in case it precipitates an event. The BNF, rather unhelpfully, doesn't quantify what they mean by uncontrolled hypertension. So um, that can be slightly challenging. <clears throat> there was a very good meta-analysis done about 15 years ago where all the different triptans were compared. <coughs> and that basically synthesizes all the sort of pros and cons to all the triptans. The one I tend to use first line is Zomatriptan partly because it's, it's relatively, relatively well tolerated, it's relatively effective, and it's off patent, so it costs about 150 for six tablets, whereas some of the on-patent drugs cost about £25 for six tablets. Sumatriptan I tend to avoid, because that doesn't tend to be that well tolerated. I also tend to use a Zomatriptan nasal spray, as opposed to a Sumatriptan nasal spray, because they tend to be more effective, and that's the ones that we tend to use in people with a significant vomiting component to their migraines. Sumatriptan injections are very good for cluster headaches. Cluster headaches are very short lasting and severe. Sumatriptan injections work fast but don't last very long. The problem with using an injection for a migraine is that it may work and make the headache go away but the headache will come back within a couple of hours when it goes out of your system. So Sumatriptan injections aren't particularly great for migraines but they're great for cluster headaches. If you look at all the sort of chronic migraine studies in very general terms, a migraine prophylactic drug will reduce the headache days by about 40% and the placebo is about 20%. So when you're using preventative drugs, if someone has maybe 10 to 12 headache days a month, there's a concern that they could fall into the vicious circle of developing a medication obvious headache because every day they'll take the triptans, it becomes 13, 14, and they start feeding the overuse headache and all of a sudden they've, they've got headaches 20 days a month. In that case, in that scenario, preventative drugs, if that reduces their migraine headache day frequency from 12 to 8, then it sort of moves them away from the risk of a medication obvious headache, and it can help by reducing the amount of headaches they get, and it can also help by eliminating the medication, the potential for them developing a medication obvious headache. The general principle is with most sort of, you know, you start low, build up slowly to reduce the chances of side effects. This is a list of all the different drugs that we tend to use. <clears throat> One I would mention is candesartan. There was a randomised control trial done about two years ago which essentially said that candesartan is about as good as propanolol and reduces migraine frequency by about two-fifths. One of the benefits of candesartan is that a lot of these drugs cause sedation, um, whereas candesartan doesn't. And also, you, I would tend to think that GPs are more confident in using candesartan than drugs like topinamate because they use it all the time in their for hypertension, kidney disease, etc. Not SSRIs. SNRIs can help, but not SSRIs. Not Verapamil. Verapamil is used for cluster headaches, not clonidine and not carbamazepine. <clears throat> greater, greater acceptable nerve blocks are not, they've not got SMC approval, so although they're used down south because they've been approved by NICE, 
the cost benefit analysis done by SMC felt that they weren't cost effective, so they're not available in NHS. Um, and gamma core is one of these sort of new devices which basically stimulates the nerves going into your head, and there is some some limited non-blended studies which suggest they may be effective. The benefit of it is there's not really any side effects. This, <coughs> that's the patient information leaflet I give to patients when I sit down, make the diagnosis, and I sort of use that as my sort of format for explaining the treatment options for them. I just thought I'd include this. Any questions? 